wait a minute. I need that one sheet. I need that sheet down there. Here. I said, can everyone hear me? You can? First, I was born in a low house out on Osage Avenue in Philadelphia. When I was a baby, we moved up to Wincote for a few years, and then we moved down on Cheltenham Avenue at Broad Street. I did my elementary school at Holy Angels Parish, graduated from Olney High School in 1938. After graduation from high school, with great difficulty, I finally found a job working in a factory, and I was approaching 21 when the government passed a law that the first peacetime draft ever to draft men between 21 and 28. The day it had drawn, I was 15 days short of 21, but I would be 21 when they would do the picking, so I had to register, and I had a low number. So. Two of my friends and myself, we decided we would join the National Guard and do our one year up at Indian Town Gap. So I enlisted in January 1941. Up to Indian Town Gap we went, and it was rough up there. None of the barracks were painted, the roads weren't paved, it was a mud pit. <laughs> However, we did our basic training, and then from there, we went, uh, when I enlisted, I was in the 111th Infantry. That's the Philadelphia Regiment and Headquarters Company down at Broad and Wharton. From, from there, we'd done our training up at Indian Town Gap. We went to the Carolina Maneuvers later in the year. When the Carolina maneuvers were just about over, our General Martin, he retired to run for governor of Pennsylvania, and they took the 111th Infantry out of the 28th Division in order to try out to make the 28th Division more mobile with three regiments like the regular army. And they made the 111th an infantry combat team. The maneuvers were over, and we're returning to Indian Town Gap. The people in Carolina, they're all cheering. We didn't know why they were cheering, but they were cheering. Oh, that, excuse me. That was the, uh, that was down at the Carolina Maneuvers. Ready to start with, are you ready to start with the slides? Yeah, I, I see he has one there. Well, we can hold off on that if you have some more to say first. Hmm? Okay. This was at the Carolina Maneuvers, uh, these slides. I'm not on there, but this, this was our kitchen. That was our mess kitchen. <laughs> on, our, on our way back from the Carolina Maneuvers, the people are cheering. We didn't know why. I was a private sitting in the back of a truck. When we finally stopped to make camp, they read the riot act to us, to us that the Japs had bombed Pearl Harbor. We finally got back to Indian Town Gap, and everybody got a furlough except the 111 combat team. We're going to go out and do guard duty. We went down to Hopewell, Virginia, and this is in Hopewell, Virginia. That's our or a guardhouse there. That's me in the center. Back in here, you can see the tents. We lived right in the town. Nobody fed us. We didn't have any kitchen. The people in the town fed us. And I, uh, my, my line of guard duty was out on a trellis bridge over the Appomattox River. It was a, uh, like somewhat like the bridge on the River Qua and it was like a mile long. And the ammunition trains from the Hercules powder plant in Hopewell would go back and forth over this bridge. If you were caught out in the middle, you had to climb down underneath the bridge. So 
so the train would go over your head. But after they put up lights and telephones and booths, they hired civilian guards, and we were all sent down. The whole regiment was brought together again, and we did guard duty from Cape Hatteras up to Rehoboth Beach, guarding the Atlantic coast. Now, while we were, and then we were stationed in Camp Pendleton, Virginia, which is just south of Virginia Beach. While, while I was there, they had lowered the qualifications to go to aviation cadets. And I figured, well, this is my chance. I'd like to try and fly. So I made out the application to go into the cadets, and I took it into the colonel. I went over my first sergeant's head, because I didn't know what he would do with it. And I went right to the colonel, and he signed the papers, and I sent them in. About a week later, the orders came down. I'm no longer in the infantry. I'm in the Army Air Corps, but they, Army Air Force, and they broke me down because they lowered my rank back to basic private because I was no longer in the infantry, and they sent me to Florida. Eventually, I made my way to classification in Nashville and took all the tests, and I qualified to go to pilot school. That's, that's me as a cadet down in the Maxwell Field where they sent me for pre-flight training for a pre-flight training. This was, a, this was in Nashville at the classification center. From Maxwell Field after pre-flight, I was sent to Arcadia, Florida to do primary flying. Now, I was never in an airplane in my life, not even up close to one. The first time I was in one, I was trying to fly it. You had 10 hours to solo this, this PT-17. And it was a pretty good plane to fly. I was very good at flying it. I could spin it and I could roll it, but every time I came in to land it, I bounced it a little bit. And my instructor, he didn't think I should be a pilot. So he sent me back to the classification center the second time I was there. And they reevaluated me and said I could either be a navigator or a bombardier if I wanted to. I said, I'll be a bombardier. And I went, they sent me out to Santa Ana, California for pre-flight training. Then to Deming, New Mexico uh, for bombardier school. I finished in June of 1943 and was commissioned. Now, my first, this was when I was commissioned. Now, my first assignment that I was given after graduating from Deming was in a B-24 base up in Boise, Idaho. The squadron, I, I do not remember the name of the group, the number of the group, nor the squadron. I could probably find it out in the history book because my squadron operations officer was Jimmy Stewart. So, but I really didn't get to know him. I did have to get his signature on my flight records because three days after I was there, here I'm on a list to go to B-29 school in Denver, Colorado. And I had to clear the base and that's when I got his signature. And we went down, I went down to Denver, Colorado and there was several hundred of us taken the course to be remote control turret officers in B-29s. We didn't have any B-29s at Lowry Field in Denver. We had mock-ups of the whole system in classroom study. We are all studying very hard because this is the first pressurized airplane. It's nice and warm in this plane. However, while we were in the school there, Two B-29 planes that were test planes crashed. It put the whole program back. Now here we are, we're out in Denver. We're having a vacation now, nothing to do for about two weeks. Then they decide to send us to be crew members to make up crews. 
And I was sent down to Paiute, uh, Texas, where I met my first pilot, Paul Kessler, and we were to form a crew around us in a B-17. And uh, when the 10 of us got together, we finished our training at Paiute. Then from Paiute, we were sent up to Dyersburg for more training, Dyersburg, Tennessee, more training. And after we were finally trained, we were sent out to Kearney, Nebraska, and given a brand new B-17 for a whole crew of 10. We're all, the, the, the enlisted gunners are all deciding what are we going to name this plane. We hadn't picked a name for it yet. In fact, we never did get a name for it because we were sent to Goose Bay and from this was our crew, but the picture there is taken in England. This was my pilot, Paul Kessler, great pilot, my navigator, myself, my co-pilot, a waste gunner, or ball turret gunner, or radio operator, flight engineer, ball turret gunner, and, and another waste gunner. So, we from Goose Bay, we were, we, were, we were sent up to Goose Bay to fly to England, to fly to, actually to fly to Presswick, Scotland, on the radio beam. <clears throat> Our instructions were, the cloud levels below 3,000 feet, when you get to Ireland, land at the first field. They didn't want us to go over the clouds because the Germans would meet in the radio station and have us over France out of gas. And it was raining when we come into Donegal Bay in Ireland, and we landed the plane in Enniskillen, Ireland. From Enniskillen, they sent us over to Belfast. When we got to Belfast, they took our plane away. Now we couldn't have no name for it. And they sent us to England. When we got to England, they sent us back to Ireland again for more training. For more training for the pilots to learn the radio system. After we finished training there, then they sent us to our group, our 385th Bomb Group in England, in the Great Ashfield, England. We were in the 4th Combat Wing in the 3rd Division, and that's when we started to fly our first missions. Our very first mission, we flew to Tutal, and we got fighter escort, and it was a very, very deep penetration. It was at the time when they were doing Big Week, and after coming back and flying a couple missions, we started a series. They decided to start to try to bomb Berlin. They had tried earlier in January, but the weather was too bad. And on the 3rd of January, we were briefed to go to Berlin. We're out over the North Sea at about 20,000 feet, and the B-24s of the 2nd Division are leading the way in, and they couldn't get over the clouds. And they turned around and recalled and flew back through the all the 17s and planes were flying all over the North Sea and they recalled the whole mission. It was a very harrowing experience. We lost a lot of planes, but they were never recorded because they weren't lost over enemy territory. And we got back to England. And that was on the 3rd of March. On the 4th of March, we woke up and here we're briefed to go to Berlin again. This time we're gonna go by the southern route. We started on that mission and we're halfway there, and we got caught in the jet stream, most of the, most of the whole 8th Air Force. One wing got over and did bomb Berlin, but the rest of them had to go back to England. The next day we were off. On the 6th of March, they had us briefed again. We were a new crew. Where? Berlin again. We couldn't believe it. And this time, there was close to 900 planes heading for Ber Berlin. Some turned around before to actually have maybe engine trouble, but when the end result was, we went straight into Berlin. There was 600 and, about 650 of us actually got there. We had a lot of fighter attack, a lot of heavy, heavy flak. 
We lost 69 bombers that day, 11 fighters, and 109 planes damaged badly. It was the biggest loss ever, even to this day, in the history of aviation flying. We on our plane, we lost an engine and had quite a few holes. So that was pretty rough. We would made it all right. In the seventh, we didn't do anything, but on the eighth, we went to Berlin again. And on the ninth, we went there again. If all the crews didn't do that. We just happened to be picked each time. We did five missions to Berlin in seven days. Well, after the fifth one, then we started to fly different missions to Munster, Munich, quite a few places, and uh, Brunswick, Ludwigshaven, Quackenbrook. Now this mission to Polish down here at the that's in Posen, near Posen, Poland. We logged 11 hours and 20 minutes on that mission. We didn't think we were going to make it back. We actually threw our black suits out over into the North Sea to lighten the plane so we wouldn't run out of gas. At <laughs> the Polish, we flew a couple more missions to Berlin. Now, by this time, we're getting pretty well experienced, our crew. And as you get more experience, they would move you up into a higher position in the group of planes that was flying. Now, in this mission to Zwickau, that we went on the 12th, the 12th of May, we had the 385th, it was like 21 planes leading the group to Zwickau. And back of the 385th was a composite group made up of two squadrons of the 447th group and one squadron of the 385th. Which, which would be the high squadron. And we were in that high squadron in the composite group going to Zwickau. <laughs> when we reached the Rhine River, Zwickau's pretty deep in the Germany. We got attacked by enemy fighters. They came through there so fast you could hardly get a bead on them to shoot at them. And they shot down the lead plane of the 447th group. When the lead plane got shot down, our squadron had to take over the lead. Now here I was leading the whole composite group by my, well, as the lead for the 21 planes and the target Zwickau. When we reached Zwickau, the bombardier in the lead group, he couldn't pick the target up right away and they decided to fly around and come back a second time but I had picked up the target, and I went ahead and I bombed the target. Oop, where are we at here? Well, right here. I hit the target. By the time they came back around again, they couldn't very well bomb in all the smoke, and they bombed the rest of the airfield. And for this mission, we were awarded the presidential citation. Here, here was the aiming point, was on this building right here. This was a factory, and this was part of the factory. And our group of bombs from our group went in this area. Over here was where they came through and they bombed the airfield. I don't know whether you can see the airplanes, or they don't show up on this as much as they do on a regular photo. Oh, excuse me, yeah, here we go, excuse me. I thought he had that turn around the other way, yeah. That's where the, where the rest of the, the, uh, the second group when they came around. And we destroyed a lot of planes and destroyed the factory and given the presidential citation. This was getting now close to D-Day. And after, after, after this mission, we flew a few more missions and then it was D-Day. Flying on these missions, D-Day was actual. When we would fly on missions, we would take escape photos with us. We would carry pictures, and they were different sizes. And I'm supposed to look like a poor Frenchman. In case I got shot down, or we went down, they could, the French could make us identity cards because they couldn't get film. Now, but on June the 
After Versailles, uh, after uh, Zwickau, I done the lead missions on Osnabrück, Chaumont, Liège, Versailles. Con on D-Day was a little different. We bombed like in a frontal and bombed the beaches and spread it in front of them. We only bombed in the ground ahead of the troops that were coming in. And D-Day happened to be a very easy mission because they had all the guns firing at the troops coming in. But we didn't know what to expect when we were briefed to go on that mission. The sweat was just as hard as the actual battle. But we came back. When I reached my 29th mission, here I'm supposed to fly 30 missions. Our group said, there's no such thing as 30 missions. You can keep flying, you go down, or you can go home for 30 days and come back. So when I hit number 30, we said we'd go home. And off we went. They put us, we went home. They cut the orders, and while they, after the orders were cut, higher headquarters said they couldn't do that, but we were already on our way, and the orders were cut. And I was put on the USS America. It was about 400 of us or so going back, and we had 2,000 German prisoners of war on that ship with us on the USS America or the West Point. And it only took five days to go over. We went home and I had my 30 days at home. And after my 30 days at home, we, we went down to Atlantic City. When we got down to Atlantic City, they gave us all physical exams and they said, we don't need the enlisted men back because they cut the crews down from 10 men to nine men. They took a waist gunner off and we have a lot of gunners. And they only made the officers return. When we returned back to England, they allowed the pilots that were with us to fly C-47 cargo. Well, I wound up back to my squadron and my commanding officer, Archie Benner, he said to me, what are you doing here? He couldn't believe that I was back. I said, they made me come back. He said, oh no, he said, they shouldn't have made you come back. He said, but you're back. He said, I'll get you a job working in headquarters, you know. He said, it wasn't right. However, he was still flying because as a commander, he would only fly like every 10 or 20th mission. He got shot down over France a little while later. He, he didn't get captured by the Germany, but he landed and occupied France, and they sent him home, and we got a new CO. And after we got this new CA, Major Reed, he ran, he, had, he ran into a bind, and one of the crews, when Harold Prang's crew, the bombardier flying on another ship didn't return. And he asked me if I would fly again on Harold Prang's crew. And I said, all right, I'll fly. And he put me back in the air. And I flew 20 missions, mostly with Prang and with a couple other pilots. It was all on uh, this, this here is Harold Prang's crew. It was Ruby's, called Ruby's Raiders. Now, Ruby's Raiders wasn't actually his plane. It was flown by another crew that completed, and then he got the plane, and then I was placed on with him. This fellow here, he was from Wilmington. He died here shortly after he came home. His name was McHugh and Drake. These fellows, I can't remember. I got their names written on the back, but I didn't go through training with them like I did with my first crew. And after I finished, when I reached 50 missions, when I reached these 50, on this mission here, we went back to Zwickau on another mission. This mission here at, at Sweena Monday, this is the one that the Germans complain about us killing so many people. And we were bombing those submarine pens that the Nazis wanted to escape in after the war. <laughs> so, that was a pretty rough mission. Of all these missions, that was probably the roughest one, because they had all the big German 155 guns on their old battleships that were docked in the docks there. When I reached my 50th mission, the group executive officer, he took me in the commanding officer. We had a new commanding officer, Colonel Jumper. And Colonel Jumper, 
uh, Colonel McDonnell, he took me in the Colonel Jumper. He said, this is the first man that ever flew 50 missions in our group. I think you ought to let him go home. So they let me go home. And through my 50 missions, our group was one of the best groups in the 8th Air Force in flying formation. We flew such tight formation that we didn't get too many German attacks. They would attack the other planes and leave our group alone. Everything in flying those missions was how good your groups flew their formations. And our commanding officer, Colonel Van Dievender, he was the, the uh, pilot that flew the nurses out of the Philippines right after Pearl Harbor. And he was a stickler for formation flying. So, well, that's my lucky bastard club for flying 50 missions. They don't have a name of a ship because there never was a ship that we actually owned with a name. But that was, that's a copy of it. The, when, uh, when I went back on my second tour, on the Christmas Eve, on the 24th of December, 19... 44. Colonel Castle, who gave me my DFC, was leading that mission, but he, when I came back, he was made a general, and he was leading that whole mission, and he got shot up, and he held the plane up to everybody got out, and he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, Colonel Castle, and the Castle Air Force Base in California was named after him, so... That's a picture of Colonel Castle there. But however, now I came home. When I came home, I had 30 days furlough. That's when I met my wife. We met, I met my girlfriend, who wasn't my wife yet. And I was out with her most every night when I was home and I had to go out to Santa Ana and I said, I said, don't worry, I said, don't worry. I said, I'm going to go out to California, and I'm going to be the first guy out. I said, they're letting them out now if you have like 50 or 60 points. And I had 165 points. I had every campaign in Europe, plus all my air medals, time. I had a lot of time. I said, I'll be the first guy out. And on my way out to Santa Ana, we got out to Santa Ana. They got bombardiers. They were never even overseas, and they're already processed, and they're out, and they froze my MOS. They knew what they were doing. There was a group of us coming out there, and we were all experienced. Got out there, you're frozen. And they sent us down to Midland, Texas. A couple hundred bombardiers, all from the 8th Air Force that had come back that had their 30, 35 missions or what have you. And down to Midland, Texas, we go, and they're going to train us to go to the Pacific. But then the big news was we dropped the A-bomb. And then I would finally get out. I would be allowed to go home for good. They lost my first daughter. I was supposed to go back to Indian Town Gap. They lost my first daughter. And then they closed Indian Town Gap up for discharge and Air Corps out of them. We had to wait till they opened up Mitchell Field. When they opened up Mitchell Field, I went home. I went up to Mitchell Field and I got discharged. And then after I came out, I got came home and I dated my my Pauline. Her name was Pauline. And we got married in 1946. We had three love, three fine sons. My three, three of the greatest sons. My oldest son is a professor of medicine at Temple. He has my name. He's a pulmonary specialist. My second son is a PhD chemist with Procter and Gamble. My third son is a PhD in pharmaceutics and he works for Johnson and Johnson. Myself, I work for ITE circuit breaker as a welder and a fitter. And I retired from there. My wife had worked for later in years for McNeil. McNeil uh, makes Tylenol, so part of Johnson & Johnson family. And uh, I have nine grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren, and my wife passed away a year and a half ago. 
and that's about all of it. They say this here now, this here is summer, this past August. My grandchildren, they bought me a ride in a B-17. And that's my grandson, he carries my name. That's Gilbert the Third. it's myself. This is the B-17. That's the seat that we'd sit in there for 10 hours on a flight, take off and landing. Wait a minute, oh. I couldn't get around now. I was a lot thinner then. But this over here, that's the site for the chin turret. In other words, when the, uh, when you would, the enemy would, when fighters would be in the area, you would reach down and hook a latch, and you would swing that over, and you would sight through that, and it would operate the chin guns. <coughs> this over here is the bomb site. Here's, the, here's where you peer through the, through the telescope. This here is the Delaware River right here. We're actually in the air. They took me up for a ride in that B-17. And my grandson, he couldn't get over it. He said, Granddad, he says, I don't know how you fellas ever did this. He couldn't hear you for the noise. And I said, well, I said, now you understand why I don't hear it too good? He says, I don't even know how you hear it at all. So <laughs> that was it. These are. Uh, that's about the story of it. All right. Okay, thank you. Gilbert, thank you very much. Any questions of Gilbert? Oh. Yeah. Uh, you were saying that um, when you first started flying from England, that you had this harrowing experience where the flight was called back what was this again? When you're flying, one of the first flights, flying towards Germany, you were called back, and all the flights, all the uh, planes turned back. You said it was a harrowing experience, and that you lost a lot of planes, but uh, it wasn't mentioned because it wasn't over enemy territory. Question is, how harrowing was your experience and how many planes were actually lost? When? When? No. On you mean on that, on that first flight? On the first flight? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We, we didn't know they, because they wouldn't publish them. If, they, if a plane didn't go down in England, I mean uh, in enemy territory, we didn't admit that we had a loss. If we lost a hundred planes in the North Sea, we'd say we didn't have any losses. But did you engage the uh, Germans? In other words, uh... Well, no, 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 they so didn't burn. Uh, why did you lose the planes then? The weather. Oh. The weather was so bad. Okay. You couldn't get through it. Every time you went into the clouds, you'd start to freeze up. I your, see. Your rings would start to freeze up, and we'd fly around. And actually, it, on that same mission, I seen a B-17 and a B-24 head-on collide. Wow. Right over the North Sea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the Norton bomb site, and uh, I wondered uh, whether you used that, and sometimes you hear them joke about it because it was supposed to be so secret, but then... No, we, we always used the Norton bomb site yeah. on every mission that I flew. Was and it good? Mm -hmm. Was it a good bomb site? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure, it was a good bomb, as long as you had a nice steady run. Yeah. If you had, a, you needed about a minute, a minute and a half to get a good sight, you know, straight and level. But if you're bobbing around up there and you didn't have much time, then it was hard. And in fact, uh, on the crew, the only one that carried a gun was the bombardier. I would carry a 45, and that was in case your plane got shot down. I could take that gun and fire through the telescope so that the Germans wouldn't know how it worked. <laughs> And they said, that if you go down, after you shoot the telescope, throw the gun away. You don't want to get caught with the gun. <laughs> Better get this uh, before he decides to leave, right? Leaving it all. Did you have any contact with the Tuskegee Airmen? And if so, could you describe how that worked or... Anything you know? 
Anything you know about them? Did I have any contact with what? He wants to know, did you have any contacts with the Tuskegee Airmen? They flew out of Italy. No. I don't think he had any contact. No, with no, them. we didn't have any contact with the 15th at all. No, no, they flew out of Italy. No, they flew out of Italy. In Italy, they no, flew out of Italy in Africa. Uh, they flew mo uh, a total of more missions. The, uh, if they flew up into Germany, it would count as flying two missions. But if they flew like the Yugoslavia, it would count as one, or like Bulgaria. And consequently, in the 15th Air Force, they used to have to fly 50 missions, but actually maybe they flew like 35. You, you really, don't, you, it was a little different. Any other questions? I can show them a couple of these pictures if you want. Did you want to? Well, uh, Are you going to put on some more of those slides if you want? I want you to tell them about your 200th uh, mission, Carnival. Oh, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. Now, this here, I sent this home. See, I'm invited to a 200th mission carnival on 1 October 1944. That's my 25th birthday. This was actually in England, and we were having a carnival, and all the little English children could come in there, and they're going to have ice cream. It was illegal to make ice cream in England. Some of these kids were seven, eight, nine years old and didn't even know what ice cream was. And we were having hot dogs and ice cream and the carnival rides and they could go through the airplanes. And I sent this home, I put it in a letter and I had to cross it out, but on here it had our address, 385th and Great Ashfield, because it was censored. And then this was the program that we had in there. And on our program we had food and fun. We had Glenn Miller was there. Glenn Miller, this was one of the last performances that he gave. I don't know whether it was his last one, but after he left England, he went back to Europe, and that's when he was missing, going back to, uh, going back to France. And if you see, we had uh, Beatrice Lilly and Paula Green. Remember Ben Lyons? He was a master of ceremonies. Now, we had to play movie, and in the evening, uh, you had the Enlisted Man's Dance in the Hangar with the music by Glenn Miller. And if you've seen the uh, Memphis Bell, it was very much like they showed in Memphis Bell, the same way. And the officer's dance was in the gymnasium. But of course, most of the officers and myself, we snuck over there and we stood in the background because we wanted to watch Glenn Miller too. <laughs> and. Uh, but I sent that home, and I still have that, but that's the original program. Okay, next Anything? question. Yeah, next right here, Anything sir. Else? Over here. Yeah. Question here. Oh, excuse I, I me. Had a, I had a question about the, you were talking about flying in formation, the planes. Could you explain a little bit about how the pilots do that and why it's so important? Oh, well, I <laughs> you just had to be a good pilot. He'd fly wingtip to wingtip. And uh, my first pilot, he had nerves of steel. He could fly that plane, hold it right in the air. And as long as you were flying good formation, the Germans, they knew that when they came in there, they're gonna get a whole lot of guns on them. We, uh, and uh, out of about, uh, I'm not sure how many groups there were in the eighth, bomber groups, but I'm pretty sure it was pretty close to 40 or 45. And we were like third for having the fewest planes she was attacked by German fighter planes. That was one of the, I only, of my 50 missions, there was only about four missions where I had fighter planes come in on. The flak that was heavy. Berlin, the flak, oh my gosh. That's when we, when we went over Berlin, the flak knocked one of our engines out and put about 15 holes in the plane, but we got back all right. Other than that. The secret to that was keeping a steady airspeed. Because if the lead pilot is jockeying his airspeed, all the 12 or 13 planes behind him are doing the same thing. You're not going to have a good solid formation. So the lead pilot really dictates how well that formation is going to be right. flying in the air. Yeah. Yes, sir. At one point you said something about uh, 
going back to a place uh, that you didn't go to or something, and you said the, the sweating about it was worse than being there almost or as bad, and I wondered if you could describe that. What, the, the weather? No, no, you're, I, I, the sweating, uh, the nerves, I got the impression. It was a, it was a tough mission. Oh. And you're, you were nervous about going back to the, to the uh, target a second time or a third time. Oh, no, we, no, we were, no, I was saying the lead group of 21 planes. See, in other words, like maybe we'd had two groups that's going to hit the target. Sometimes you'd have 10 groups going to hit the target. But the first group going in, if he didn't pick up his aiming point right away, he would make a second run, come back and do a second run. Well, he coming back and doing a second run, we were the next group in and we hit the target. Then by the time they got back around... excited he's back he's back in 1944 I'll uh, see what you've done there you got them all sweaty now <laughs> where was I we uh, Co was coming around the bomb the oh, second time. yeah when you come around the bomb the second time by the time they came around again there's so much smoke all over there the rather than bomb right into the smoke well they hit the airplanes that are built out on the field seen and he bombed the rest of the field. Now those pictures there, that picture there that you seen was taken by the like three, four, five hours after the flight. Like by the uh, intelligence to go out and see what damage it's take done by the P thirty eight planes that they use. I, I, I might add that uh, it encouraged doing that, going around the second time because no, keep in mind You've got a group that's probably 39 airplanes that's making a turn. He's coming back and trying to get into that bomber stream. Mm -hmm. He's going to add tremendous amount of confusion, possibility of collisions and so forth. So it was not, it was not recommended. It was always an accident that had happened. See, like a mission like that, it was a, just two groups going to a target. Now, sometimes if it's a bigger group, maybe you have 10 or 15 groups going to a big target, like in the Berlin, then if you went around, you're just like he says, you'd be flying into the other planes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Well, Gilbert, I enjoyed your talk very much. <laughs> I hope it's, it was it's interesting. Yeah. It, it was interesting for me to hear Gilbert's